ladies and gentlemen, recorded in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. It's time for Fight Night Picks with your host, Frank and Matt Allen. Meat card coming up this weekend from Vegas. Can't wait for it. As always, one half of your host, you know, Craig Allen. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Craig Allen FNP. With me to my left, to your right, as always, one half of the Fight Night Picks crew, Matt Allen. You can find him at Matt Allen FNP. Now, Matt, they normally say that the total is equal to the sum of its parts. And when I look at this card, it is a little different. Islam Makachev taking on Tiago Moises up at the top. Originally, we were supposed to get, well, Max Holloway, Yair Rodriguez. There's all different sorts of fights that have fallen out, fights that have popped up. Hell, Preston Parsons is going to be fighting Daniel Rodriguez. But overall, there's a lot of really interesting fights. I went back through and looked. Five fighters are making their second trip out. We obviously have that debut for Preston Parsons. So this is one of those cards where I might slip up and catch myself as saying... Really interesting, but I am eager to see a lot of these fights. And these are always the cards that tend to overperform. You know, you go into the weekend, you don't have very high expectations, and then, wow, Mateusz Gabriel versus Jeremy Stevens somehow becomes like a fight of the year candidate. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but there are a lot of at least potentially entertaining fights up and down this whole entire card. I know I'm really excited for Billy Q versus Gabriel Benitez. And other than that, there's still a lot of really interesting fights. And here's the other good thing. A star should be made in the main event no matter what. Because for the longest time, people said, okay, Islam Makashi, is that guy. He just hasn't had his opportunity yet. Well, finally, he's going to get his opportunity in a big five-round slot against Tiago Moises. I know I'm pretty excited. You, me, and CBS's Brian Campbell might have just continued to say Kevin Lee future champ, but there are so many people, and I can't stress this enough, there is a C of people saying Islam Makachev future champ. He is a really, really interesting fight coming up this weekend. And overall, as a rollover from last weekend, UFC 264, Fairly positive results. The QMK parlay hit. I was able to come back a little bit on the picks. But overall, it should be a great one coming up this weekend. You already kind of teased it a little bit. Let's throw it on over to our Fight of the Night screen, which is always presented to you by Manscaped. Check them out. It's manscaped.com. Promo code FNP. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping. So let's throw it on over to the Fight of the Night screen. So, this weekend coming up, in the main event, you have Islam Makachev, he's taking on Tiago Moises. In the co-main event, you have Marion Renault taking on Misha Tate in a fight that you didn't know you needed. But, listen, we have a great fight on the main card. This one is at lightweight, with a guy that's competed at lightweight in the past, maybe more known so for his featherweight time, taking on the former KSW champ, Mateusz Gamrot. I can't wait for this fight. This is going to be absolutely fireworks because for Mateusz Gamrot, we understand you have a fight of the night and one of the better fights of the year against Guron Kutateladze in his UFC debut. And then his next time out against Scott Holtzman absolutely flatlines him. So now this should be a really fun fight against Jeremy Stevens, a big name opponent too. And this is one thing, whatever your opinion is of Jeremy Stevens, mine's probably like 10% higher. So I really do think this is going to be an absolutely wild fight. Yeah. But for Jeremy Stevens coming in here 0 and 4 with a no contest in his last five fights against really good competition. Aldo, Megamed, Sharipov, Rodriguez twice, and then Calvin Cater's last time out for Gamrot. Again, the former champ, and he has delivered. Even in the loss against Guram, he has looked very good. So let's throw it on over to our other choice. You might look at our next fight and go, guys, you're crazy. Khalid Taha taking on Sergey Morozov. Why would you pick this as a possible fight of the night? Well, let me tell you why. Both of these guys lost their last fights in impressive fashion. For Morozov, former champ over with M1 Global, he fights Umar Nurmagomedov, he gets finished rather quickly. For Kalataha, well he gets beat down for three rounds, and I get it, there were 30-27s there, he fought Hany Barcelos, but still, for Kalataha, when he's on, he's on, you saw that in his fight against a really tough opponent, Bruno Silva, he got the win, he finished him, but ultimately overturned to a no contest, his timeout before that, he knocked out Boston Solomon, and even before that, he lost the decision to Nadine Rimani when he made his debut, but both of these guys, fan-friendly styles, I think we're going to have a lot of action in this fight, and it's going to be won or lost in the scrambles in this one. This should be a really fun fight, and that exactly is what this fight comes down to, the scrambles. And it should be really fun, because you have two guys known for moving forward, and both guys who can initiate the wrestling sequences. It's not like Sergey Morozov is automatically going to be the one shooting on Kali Taha, or the other way around. You have two guys who just match up really well across the board, and that's why this fight should be so much fun. This should be an absolute banger. You're not going to want to miss it. As always, our Fight of the Night screen presented by Manscaped. Check them out, manscaped.com. Use promo code FNP. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping, and you can bet yourself 
that I'm going to talk about my nuts later on in the show. You're not going to want to miss that. So overall, a big time card coming up this week on Makachev taking on Moises in the main event. You've got Misha Tate's weird roundabout comeback fight against 44-year-old, and she just turned 44. So happy birthday to Marion Renault, who's 9-7-1, but has taken on a very tough level of competition the entire time she's been with the UFC. And even before that, a fight against Julia Avila from before, well, both of their times in the UFC. Matt, we've got all sorts of great content coming out this week with Fight Night Picks. A couple of great interviews already banked with our own JHK. You're going to have early stoppage. And if you can't get enough of this channel, well, it just turns out that we're not just MMA guys, Matt. And listen, it will look like it this way, but we had a video not that long ago. We opened a blaster box of the Panini Prisms. We opened a couple more on our new channel. It's called 15 Minute Card Breaks. And we say, let's tear the cover off over there. Exactly. A baseball reference. But we have another video where we open those two up. We just dropped the video as well. We had an unboxing of a hit parade. It's a mystery box. You get an autographed full-size batting helmet. It was 15 out of 100. And Matt, our score, a former Cy Young winner. I'll just leave it there, but you can check it out over there. All sorts of great sports. Baseball, football, hockey, all sorts of awesome content over there. 15 minute card breaks. We say, let's tear the cover off over there. But Matt, great content coming out on this channel too this week. And as we always say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Straight up weird fight coming up this weekend at heavyweight. We have Rodrigo Nascimento. He's going to be taking on Francis Alain Bado. And Matt, for both of these guys, They've got some pretty famous training partners. For Bado, I mean, at one point, you would have had Francis Ngannou at the MMA Factory. Now, Coach Ferdinand Lopez. But you also have top-ranked future title challenger. And I can't stress that enough, Cyril Gaon. And if you look at it for Nascimento, a guy that trains out of American Top Team, you see a lot of famous guys in the pictures. A couple of different Brazilians. I know Marcus Rogério de Lima, one of those guys. Juan Espino out of the Canary Islands. Juan, where you at? Seems like he's fighting now, and it's great to see that. And he almost beat... A really tough out in Alexander Romanov. That was until a weird fight. Some sketchy circumstances. Yeah, you just didn't like the end of it. Uh, also has uh, Marcus Almeida as well to round out that corner. In terms of the jiu-jitsu, and I really want to throw a shout out before I hand it off, Matt, because we've seen this guy coach all the time. I know Dia Davis is one of those guys that works the boxing in American Top Team. But coach Marcus Damata is a guy that we see every single weekend. It seemed like he was a part of every single fight at UFC 264. He's the little short guy, but man, does he ever pack a punch in terms of his coaching ability. So for Rodrigo Nascimento, you know exactly what you're going to get. 8-1 the total record. He was a big favorite in his last fight, taking on Chris Dawkins, where he decided he was going to strike and not necessarily known for his striking acumen. He is a superb jiu-jitsu player. You saw that when he was able to submit Dante Mays, who again is a boxer, yeah. but you saw how strong he is, how dominant he can be on the ground. Decided he was going to throw a few single shots and leave his hand uh, head out there, rock him, sock him style, and Dawkins was able to totally outdo him. Same can be said for Alain Badeau, Matt, in his last fight against Tom Aspinall. And both of these guys took on really good fighters in their debuts. So let's throw it on back for just a second. And we'll talk about Alain Badeau, who's about to make his second time out with the UFC. Now he's taking on Alain Badeau. And this is a guy that, I mean, he trains out of another great gym in the world. MMA Factory. Main training partners include Francis Ngannou, Cyril Gaon, And you've seen Ferdinand Lopes. Just do big things in MMA. That's a gym that you definitely have to watch out for. Now for Monsieur Alain, he's coming up from 205 pounds. He had a fight against not Sam Stout, but Todd Stout, guy that trains in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, for the TKO Light Heavyweight Championship. And listen, Matt, we've gone back. We watched that terrible highlight reel if you're not Dolce Champ with EFC. But if you're Alain Badu, I mean, man, the guy got knocked out so hot and heavy against Dolce Lujambula. It didn't go his way. In the Todd Stout fight, he lost it. I mean, he threw caution to the wind in his striking. And then when it, you know, and I hate to use cliche, but when the rubber hit the road, the guy got taken down. Stout took his back, submitted him. And then, my God, it seems like every week we have to talk about a fighter whose fight's overturned to either a no contest or a loss. But Todd Stout, that fight is now a loss on his record. And for Alain Badou, it's considered a win, even though he lost it. So for Alain Badou... I just worry about the wildness of his striking. Yeah, will it win him some fights? I mean, it's one of eight this far, seven. But in a fight against Tom Aspinall, man, I worry. 
So, Matt, that's the scoop on Alain Badeau, who's about to make his second time out with the UFC. This fight was originally scheduled to take place back in May, rebooked for July 17th. And if you look at it for Alain Badeau, not the greatest level of competition all the way up. He got knocked out emphatically by Dolce Lundjambula, Dolce Champ. And then he ends up taking a fight against who's a guy who's 0-2. He fights Todd Stout. And as we say, it's a win on his record. He got absolutely owned by Todd Stout and submitted. And then somehow ends up in the UFC off that loss. He hasn't really seemed to gain a whole lot in the year and a half from the Stout fight, the Aspinall fight. Are we going to see anything different? And frankly... Who's got the best shot here? This is an interesting fight. Even If we want to call it that. Here's the one thing both guys can kind of lean on. They both have a crutch. It's that you can't really judge them based on the last performance. Because guess what? Most heavyweights would lose to Chris Dawkins and Tom Aspinall. It's just a fact. Those are probably 1A and 1B for best prospects in the heavyweight division right now. If you want to have Cyril gone ahead of them, he's probably past the prospect phase. But I would say that those guys... Yeah, I'd say that's challenging exactly. for the title. That's is, what yeah. I mean. He would have been number one. But now that he has kind of made more of a name for himself in the heavyweight division, I really do feel like guys like Aspinall and Dawkins are the future of this division. And... For Nascimento, it was a weird fight against Dawkins, and I know that you were really impressed by his jiu-jitsu going into that fight, and for good reason, like his skills on the mat, they're really unique for a heavyweight because he not only has really good top pressure too, he's a guy who can sweep off of his back, which is honestly something you don't really see past like the middleweight division. It's weird. When Jacare fought Jacare Manson, for instance, Jacare Manson was able to take Jacare down and not really be too worried about the guard of Jacare because it does feel like the bigger you get, the harder it really is to sweep guys on the top, and especially a guy like Jacare, one of the greatest jiu-jitsu specialists of all time. It's not that Jack Hermanson is a bad grappler, just the fact that Jack Hermanson is able to spend really minutes upon minutes in top position upon a guy who is so good at jiu-jitsu, it tells you that you can get away with grappling with some people, and for Nascimento, his problem was that he went out there trying to strike with Chris Dawkins, and I, I know Chris Dawkins is really good on the mat too, so even if they, let's say they kind of match each other in jiu-jitsu, it's really hard to go out there and outstrike a guy like Chris Dawkins, and even in the couple exchanges up until he did get dropped by Dawkins, he did land a decent jab. That's one thing that Nascimento is alright at. He can keep his opponent at somewhat far range with his jab. The problem is, is when he does fight those upper level strikers, like the Aspinals, like the Dawkinses, who can move their head and really collapse that space, then he is going to have trouble. The great news is that Alain Bateau does not fight like that whatsoever and I know we're normally extremely positive about guys when they come into the UFC but I really do feel like our previous judgments on Alain Bateau do still ring true like he's just not that great at the UFC level right now and it sucks to say that but like for instance campaign right now is playing for the Phoenix Suns. He's in the finals. He's putting up big minutes. The Toronto Raptors didn't think he could play at the NBA level. Just because you're that thing now doesn't mean one day you can't become something different. It's just right now it's really hard for me to justify Alain Bado's spot in the UFC. Rodrigo Nascimento coming in this week. He was a minus 365. He's about a minus 342 or thereabouts. If we look at it for Francis Alain Bado, he opened a plus 275. He's a plus 269 right now. Over on Topology, surprised us as it is to you. Holy smokes, 992 total votes, 93% Nascimento, 69% by submission for the 7% that have Badol, let's have fun, 63% by knockout. If you look at it in the Alain Badol fights, he likes to strike. I know the broadcast talks about it in his debut. He likes to do the spinning attacks, and he does. He leaves his head out there, and it's been an issue since the Dolce and Jambula fight. Some of those fights that you can find in the regional scene, they're out there on YouTube. I know there's one on Fight Pass, but there's all kinds of tape on him out there. It's pretty easy to find it. For Rodrigo Nascimento, you look at it. Dana White's Contender Series, big win over there. Dante Mays, big win over there. Like Alain Bedo's teammate had, Cyril Gunn, a submission win over Mays. But for me, I like the parts and parcels of Nascimento's game. Could he get caught like he did in the fight against Dawkins? Sure. But I like his opportunities a lot more than I do like out of Bado, so I will ride with the Brazilian in this one. It's just really hard for me to say that Alain Bado could land like a clean check left hook on the inside like Dawkins can. Like, when it comes down to it, Dawkins can get into extended boxing combinations or exchanges, sorry, with a lot of guys in the heavyweight division. Bado does kind of need some space to get off his techniques and it is weird because I wouldn't say he's at like the Marab level of spamming spinning back fist, but he throws it way too much. It's one of those things where it's like, okay, we get it, but you're just making yourself tired. I do 
like, and here's the thing about Nascimento. If he does lose, it's going to look bad. Like, if Alain Badeau does win at the UFC level, it is going to be this crazy head kick or crazy spinning back fist. Like, it is going to look really good if it ever does happen. I just don't think he's going to be able to land one of those crazy techniques against a guy like Nascimento. Easier said than done, but for Nascimento, Tom Aspinall went for a double leg, got it, and went fully into mount just like that. So, hey, it can be done, but in this fight, both of us going with American top teams, Rodrigo Nascimento to get the win. I can't wait for this card. Up at the top, the return of the former champion, Misha Tate. She's taking on Marion Renault. And in the main event, Islam Makachev taking on Tiago Ooh. Moises. Nascimento's teammates. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, as we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. Here at Fight Night Picks, we love to keep the tradition going. Flyweight never die. Ooh. We've got a really interesting fight coming up this weekend as Canada's Malcolm Gordon is going to be taking on the brother of the former champion, Francisco Figueredo. And Matt, if you look at it for Malcolm Gordon, 2020 was an absolute wash. 0-2, both losses by finish. He took on Amir Al-Bazi in his debut. In his second time out, he took on Sumaderji. And listen, it ended, well, very quickly. So for Malcolm Gordon, it is weird. You definitely have to figure he needs to pick up a win coming into this. And even if you look at it... When he made his way into the UFC, like, some of his wins were odd. His win over Yoni Sherbatov back with TKO. Sherbatov hurt his rib. Uh, Robin Black was calling the fight with John Ramdeen here. Ooh. John, where ya at? Miss John Ramdeen with Fight Network. But when I watch Malcolm Gordon's fights, really offensive, really like to impose his will with his grappling, and he's able to get angles that just most fighters aren't normally able to get. A little susceptible to getting hit, but a really fun fighter to watch. And for Francisco Figueredo, we found a lot of tape out there. There was tape, and it was difficult to find, but he fought with a number of different organizations. The five-on-in wasn't the sexiest. He had the fights against Eduardo Souza. Uh, if you look at it, five-on-in, almost four years ago, a loss to Souza by split. Then he has the wild one to make his way into the UFC. Really odd fighter too, Francisco Figueredo, because you'd think and you'd assume maybe like brothers, the Dacus brothers. One's very specialized in grappling. One's a great grappler that happens to be a really good boxer too. But Francisco doesn't really fight like Devison does. But he kind of does, though. It's weird, because I would say Francisco Figueredo, the bare bones of his game are similar to uh, his brother. But... The problem is he doesn't have any of those, like, championship X factors that Devison does have. Like, Devison, when he hits, it doesn't really matter what kind of a technique he lands. When he lands clean on guys, they just fall down. With Francisco, he still has that kind of, like, old-timey boxer-type stance, but he's either all the way out or all the way in. It's a really odd style for Francisco Figueredo because they do like to bring up how good his boxing is, but it's weird because a lot of his work doesn't really get done in that traditional boxing range. Like, just go back to this weekend's fights. When Connor fought Dustin, when Dustin would have success, it was not when they're all the way in the outside because that's when Connor can kind of you know pot shot you from long range but when he was on the inside having those extended boxing combinations that's when Poirier would have success Francisco doesn't really play in that range whatsoever he's either all the way on the outside and if his opponent ever does try to collapse that space he almost immediately clinches and even in the Jerome Rivera fight a fight that I thought okay for sure don't go for any takedowns against Jerome Rivera because if he's good at anything it would be his jiu-jitsu now I understand maybe this weekend didn't show that off to the bet to the fullest effect but it is true like he's a BJJ black belt you probably don't want to mess with him on the mat and the fact that Francisco Figueredo was not only able to take him down but just control him on the mat it was really impressive because of all the ways to beat Jerome Rivera I would say he did it in one of the more convincing fashions and for Malcolm Gordon it will be interesting because on all the way on the inside, he is going to be able to use a lot of his own wrestling against Francisco Figueredo. And for where the odds are at, Malcolm Gordon might not even be the worst bet just because his style is that, okay, I'm just going to wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. And if he can tire out Francisco Figueredo, which has happened in the past, then he could actually make this fight somewhat competitive. It's just with Figueredo, my big question mark comes down to how good is his offensive jiu-jitsu? Because with Devison, we know how good his defensive submissions are. He's this great stand-up fighter. So when anybody tries to take him down, he's got that wicked guillotine where you listen to fight who got tapped by it they're like no he's got the squeeze does Francisco Figueredo have any counter to the striking like that because when Francisco is on his back it is a lot of okay I'm just kind of being held here I'm sort of holding on myself I don't doubt that he has good jiu-jitsu I just don't think he can use it to the offensive capabilities that his brother can so we talked about it a lot in some of the previous breakdowns of Francisco Figueredo's overall career really early on back in 2011 fought John Lineker he had those two fights against Eduardo Souza if you look at it his last time out it was with jungle fights at Jungle Fight 95. Great production values with him too. Wallet Ishmael shouts. And if you look at the way that that one ended, it was a little weird. I mean, Figueredo wasn't favored by many of the fans to get the win. And ultimately, he earns himself a chance in the UFC. 
albeit years later. That fight was back in late 2019. He makes his debut just this year, and it was back in January when he took on Jerome Rivera. Since then, he had fights fall out, one with Jimmy Flick, who just walked into a cage somewhere in the middle of nowhere and said, yeah, I'm hanging it up. While well, he had a fight booked, and then he was supposed to fight J.P. Bay, so ultimately he draws Malcolm Gordon for Malcolm Gordon. His entry to the UFC was a little weird. He had some different fights booked. He was supposed to take on Alexander Deskalchuk, a guy that you might recognize from his time with M1 Global. Draws Albazi, gets absolutely controlled on the mat, and then takes on Sumaderji and gets finished really early. It was a sub-minute finish at 44 seconds. So all of a sudden, he enters into this fight on a two-fight losing streak. Before that, some nice wins, but... Really, that two-fight losing streak, I think that's what kind of controls the odds. And you kind of touched on it. But the fact that it's really difficult to go with a guy in Malcolm Gordon who opened around a plus 195. Is it a plus 250 right now? If you look at it for Francisco Figueroa, it'll open a minus 230. He's a minus 319 right now. And if we have a look at the topology votes, 1,015 of them, 92% Figueroa. 53% by decision, 33% by knockout for the 8% that have Gordon, 45% by decision, 29% by submission. It is a really tricky one because Francisco Figueredo is just not one of those one punch, one knockout guys. But I actually think in this fight he could be, and it really does come down to the durability of Malcolm Gordon. I don't look at Malcolm Gordon like a Justin Gaethje type fighter, where it's like, okay, you will go down eventually, but it takes like 200 significant strikes. If you go back to the Sue Energy fight, and listen, Sue Energy is a far better striker than Francisco Figueredo, and at least he's a more dynamic striker on the outside. And he lit Malcolm Gordon on fire. And I do feel like the durability of Malcolm Gordon is something to question. I could see Francisco Figueredo catching him on the way in with some kind of a hook or straight shot. And I do like Francisco Figueredo in this fight. I can see it being one of these situations where Francisco Figueredo wins by stoppage, calls out one of those like borderline top 15 guys, and they automatically give him the fight because of that Figueredo connection. I could very well see that being the case this weekend. I have a really hard time with this one. I mean, Francisco Figueredo, you look at it, seven wins by submission for Gordon. There's six. The level of competition for both guys a little sketchy for Malcolm Gordon again the only share of top fight a guy that was on the ultimate fighter uh it, it is a tricky one for me I like Figueredo in this one because of his pressure and his ability in the scrambles but Malcolm Gordon if we know anything that's where he excels as well so for me if it's lined like this maybe you do like a path to that underdog for us right now both going with the Brazilian in Francisco Figueredo to get the win let us know down below in the comments section who are you taking in this fight are you going with the Canadians well, the Canadian and not us. Are you going to go with Malcolm Gordon? Do you like Figueredo in this one? And in our main event at the Ooh. end, Matt, Islam Makachev taking on Tiago Moises. You're not going to want to miss that. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. A fight I'm really looking forward to. Coming up this weekend at Bantamweight, we have Brazil's Anderson Dos Santos taking on Fortis MMA's own Miles Johns. And for Chapo, which is just a concerning nickname, Miles Johns is one of those guys that I thought I had the greatest read on him coming into the UFC. He was a former LFA Bantamweight champ. He beat Adrian Giannis by split decision to win that belt. He ends up on Contender Series, beats Richie Santiago. We're off to the races. Has a split decision fight against Cole Smith that honestly could have gone either way. Cole Smith really came on strong at the end of that one. And then he got finished his next time out. And now we're here. Now... I say that he won his last fight where he knocked out Kevin Natividad, who came in on short notice, and it was an amazing knockout. But the knockout against him, against Mario Bautista, was one of those ones where it's a wild flying knee. It seemed like all momentum was stopped, and I didn't know what I could get out of Miles Johns in that fight against Natividad. Flip of the coin for Anderson Dos Santos. This is a guy that really had a huge win over a recognizable name in Ricky Simone. He beat him for the Titan Championship, he submitted him even. He takes a little bit of time. He ends up in the UFC. He fights Nadner Imani. He loses by decision. He fights Andre Yule. He loses by decision. Then he takes on the Taekwondo master. And I joke about that. But he was actually very credentialed in Taekwondo and Martin Day. And really all he had to do was throw hammers until he could clinch and get him down and finish him. I had my reservations in that fight. If I'm not mistaken, I probably picked Martin Day. Because I look at the stat line and I go, Anderson Dos Santos is how old? And that's the weird thing. Like, it's almost like he doesn't age. And he's got 29 pro fights. And he's a week. He will be on fight night a week away from his 36th birthday. Can you believe that? It really is wild. And on a fight card that has a 44-year-old Marion Renault in the co-main event. These are strange times we're living in. But this should be an interesting fight. Really, the only question comes down to... 
how good is Miles Johns and how much stock can you put into that knockout loss? Because if you take out the loss to Mario Bautista, he should win this fight. He really should. Just technically, I feel like he is better in most aspects of MMA. And this thing about Anderson Dos Santos, I can admit I don't have a great read on him because the commentary talks like he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. How he's like, oh wow, you gotta watch out from on the feet, you gotta watch out from on the mat. Like, he's so good in all these areas. And then you actually watch him against other guys who, listen, it's not like he's fought the highest level of competition, but still, it's not like he's been fighting just the worst fighters ever and then he fights martin day here's the thing martin day is on the lower level of what a ufc fighter can be we were and sold a bill of goods we were sold a bill of goods but if you actually have watched martin day's career it just hasn't really worked out for him in the ufc and the fact that he's anderson DeSantos' only quality win is a little bit concerning if you go back to the andre yule fight like that's probably the reason i have so much stock in andre yule because he looked phenomenal in that fight and in all the lead up it was oh you gotta watch out for the boxing of dos santos like i know andre yule's good but you gotta watch out for the power of dos santos he just got boxed up the whole entire fight, and he never could just, he could never catch Andre Yule. He's not really good at closing down the cage or cutting it off. He really does just kind of throw bombs into a sloppy takedown attempt, and if it works, it works. It's just, I don't really think that style works against the upper level fighters in the UFC, and it's not that Miles Johns is at that level yet, but I definitely think he's more likely to achieve a top 15 status one day than Anderson Dos Santos is. For Anderson Dos Santos, one of those guys, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, trains out of a smaller gym, I would say, in, and I want to get it right, Babuino Gold Team. And if you look at it for Miles Johns, we talked about it, the Fortis MMA Connection. He's been there for some time now, fighting out of Dallas. And listen, if I know anything, Saif Saoud's going to come in with a good game plan. Yeah. If you've got the jiu-jitsu of like a Diego Fajaya in your back pocket, it's definitely something good. But a lot of great training partners to work with over there at Fortis. Now, when I focus on this fight, I'm all right with the odds where they're at. If I have them at open, Johns is minus 145. He's minus 179 right now. For Anderson Dos Santos, open to plus 125. He's a plus 147. If we have a look at the total topology votes, 988 of them, 93% Johns, 73% by decision. For the 7% that I have, Dos Santos, 59% by decision. Miles Johns, as long as his gas tank is good, and I can't stress that enough, should be able to pull out a win in this fight. It is a little dangerous. Again, Anderson Dos Santos is one of those guys that swings for the fences because he knows he can fall back in his jiu-jitsu and his wrestling. And it is pretty good. For Miles Johns, though, he is one of those guys that's known for his wrestling. He went to college to wrestle at Newman University. Unfortunately, fell out. He was injured, so on and so forth, and he dropped out. But he's a guy that can always go back on that. And I think the striking numbers are clean enough so far from the fights I've seen in LFA as well as the UFC that I'm confident enough with in going with Johns. I like Johns in this fight, but I'll be very honest. I'm a little apprehensive about what his ceiling can be in this division, if I'm being completely honest. like I think I'll beat Anderson Dos Santos because I look at Anderson Dos Santos is closer to like Chris Moutinho than he is to Sean O'Malley. And I look at Miles Johns as, hey, he might not be Sean O'Malley. He might not be one of those top tier prospects, but I do think he's going to be one of those like borderline 25 to 15 guys who go in there and have a fun fight with just about anyone in the division. So I agree with you. I do like Miles Johns in this Looking fight. forward to this one. Both of us going with Fortis MMA's Miles Johns in this fight. And I can't wait for the card at lightweight at the top. Islam Makachev taking on a really tough out in Tiago Moises. I'm, I'm serious. You can't overlook that guy. It's going to be a great one. So as we always say with Fight Night Picks, Matt, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. A fight I've had circled on my calendar since I found out about it. We have the warrior, Kalataha. He's going to be taking on Sergei Morozov. And Matt, we've had a lot of fighters coming out of Kazakhstan lately that have had a lot of success in the UFC. I mean, you can go up and down the roster. It could be Shavkat Rachmanov. It could be Demir Ismagulov. Sergey Morozov is one of those guys, and it's just a matter of time before he picks up his first win. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't in his first fight. He was a huge underdog against Umar Nurmagomedov. They had trained in the past together. If you look at it, master of, or yeah, it is a master sport in MMA for Sergey Morozov, a guy that will throw a nice kick to the body. He will. will throw in combination, pumps a nice jab out there, loves the overhand right, and he can get caught a little bit in some of those wrestling transitions, but by and large has some pretty good jiu-jitsu in his back pocket. He is going to be taking on a guy that fights in somewhat a similar way in Kalataha coming up this weekend, and I can't wait for it. It should be a really fun fight. For Sergei Morozov, the real question comes down to, okay, you might not be as good as Umar Nurmagomedov, but how good are you? And listen, most guys in this division probably aren't as good as Nurmagomedov, and I don't care what you think about what his ceiling is, but he really is just a unique combination of, like, speed, power, and wrestling that just you don't really see at the Bantamweight division other than, like, Marab Devalshvili. So, for Sergei Morozov, it will be interesting to 
see how does his power how does his power translate in this fight because we saw him land to certain effect on Umar but he was never really able to get more than one shot going at a time and that's really the question for Morozov moving forward he has good striking and he has good power but the output leaves something to be desired and he's one of those fighters where while you're watching it's just so easy to tell like if you just threw like one punch more per round not to throw like an exact number on it but if you could just have slightly higher uptick in his volume then I really do think he'd offer a much tougher test for a lot of guys in this division because even if you just look at the Umar and Omega Medoff fight he does have a little bit of success in that I understand he pretty much gets dealt with in the grappling I can't really defend that but hey it's gonna happen you're gonna get a grapple by Omega Medoff the success that he did have though he has a really good eye for counter shots on the feet and uh, DC brings it up in the commentary every time Omega Medoff threw a kick the second his foot came off the mat Morozov would answer with a punch, and that is really important. Just having eyes like that, it's kind of similar to having, like, court vision in NBA. It might not always equate assists, but it's just a good thing to have. And the fact that he is a very seasoned counter-striker should come into effect against a guy like Kali Taha, who can leave himself open on the feet. And when I was looking into Sergey Morozov coming into this one, you look at it on the socials, you can find him training a little bit out of Kazakhstan, but also training in South Florida for the past number of weeks, getting ready for this one. There was a snapshot of Rachmanov and Morozov, and I put three and three together, made six, and found his Instagram page after a little bit of sleuthing. But you do like to see that out of Morozov. And for Kali Taha, this is a guy that so far in the UFC, it's weird, right? Like, he fought not Neri Mani, he loses the decision. Neri Mani's very well-rounded. He's got the wrestling in his back pocket. He finishes Boston Solomon, who... It was like, hey, Boston, when are we making the UFC debut? And then it was like, see you later. And he had that weird fight uh, back on the lower levels with LFA. He fights Bruno Silva at Marvel Stadium... And he looks amazing in that fight. He and he outclassed him. He's the bigger fighter, you can tell. But then that ends up, you know, some USADA issues. He's a juicy boy. So he takes on Hani Barcellos in his last fight. And you might look at that fight and you might see the 3027s out there. I'll give you the numbers Dave Hagen, 3027. Chris Lee, 3027. Ron McCarthy, 3027. Craig Allen. Maybe a 30-25? Like, I, there was there, at least one 10-8 round. There was at least one 10-8 round. Multiples on MMA decision scored at 30-26 for Barcelos. But it earned fight of the night on the card. But it was more like a Calvin Cater, Max Holloway, or Sean O'Malley and Chris Mutino fight of the night than it was some impressive all of knock him out, drag him out type of war. Taha got beat pillar to post in that fight. So for me... It really is a weird snapshot of his career. And if you go back through it, I do like the Taekwondo that he has in his back pocket. Some of the wins, maybe not against the greatest level of competition. I mean, you can look at it from Morozov as well. He had the fights against Reading House that were a lot of fun if you want to go back and watch them. A great one against Alexander Osetrov before that. And even if you go back down through, his last loss before Nurmagomedov 2018, where he fought one really tough out in Mavzar Evlev. So... Definitely the level of competition sides with Sergey Morozov. It's just you don't necessarily love to see what you did in that Nurmagomedov fight where he was a huge underdog. And even in that fight in the first round, he got taken down. Nurmagomedov had his back with a crazy take. He was able to get out of it and get the fight back up to his feet. Will he be able to do that against a guy like Taha who is so well-rounded or we have seen the well-roundedness out of him? I don't know. That's what makes this fight so much fun. And when I look at the odds... That's where I'm ever so slightly tempted to go with the underdog. I mean, Taha open to minus 150. He's a minus 165. Mornozov open to plus 130. He's about a plus 136 on best fight odds. And out of the total picks on Tapology, it's a surprise to me as it is to you. 977 the total votes. 57% Mornozov, 83% by decision. 43% have Taha, 61% by decision. I honestly like Sergey Morozov by decision in this fight. Here's the thing. I will admit the best version of Kali Taha would pose quite a few issues for Sergey Morozov. If you do combine the wrestling and the ground and pound of Kali Taha along with this not great, but I would say very good top position, then there is a recipe there to beat a guy like Sergey Morozov. It's just we haven't seen that version of Kali Taha in a long time. Like, you gotta remember, when Adesanya fought Whitaker, that was years ago now. Like, it, it, it's not as recent as I tend to think it is. So I do kind of like Morozov as the underdog in this fight. Matt, both of us going with the former M1 champ in Sergey Morozov. Let us know if we're absolutely nuts down below in the comments section. But I am really looking forward to this fight. And the lightweight chart topper. You've got Islam Makhachev taking on Tiago Moises at lightweight. Up at the top, you're not going to want to miss that. So keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. As we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Big time fight coming up at Women's Strawweight. We have Brazil's Amanda Lemos taking on Montserrat Ruiz. And Matt, 
We had it as Montserrat Canejo. It should be Canejo, so we're going to go with Montserrat Canejo. In this fight, Mexico's on Canejo is a really interesting specimen because she trains out of King's MMA. She also trains out of 10th Planet. She has an insane wrestling pedigree. And you know what? We talked a lot about it in her debut when she took on Cheyenne Bass. So let's throw it on over to that intro. We'll throw it on back to this fight because I think that stylistically, this makes for a really interesting match. Taking on Montserrat Ruiz. Her nickname is Canejo. It means rabbit. And if you really look at it on topology, it's rabbit mad. And I'm rabbit mad. I'm really looking forward to this fight because for Montserrat Ruiz, we look at her overall. She trains with King's MMA. You saw her in the corner of Jocelyn Edwards over on Fight Island. And listen, it didn't work out in Jocelyn's second fight. It happens against Carol Hosa. But if you look at it in her debut, it went swimmingly against Wu Yanan. And for Montserrat Ruiz, I mean, just an awesome amount of pressure. I know I went back and I watched some of the pre-fight stuff for Invicta debut when she took on one really tough out UFC vet, Danielle Taylor. And listen, very stoic and thoughtful woman. I mean, she really picks and chooses what she says. But listen, representing Mexico, she's training now in the States. And she really talked about the fact that she began her mixed martial arts journey in wrestling. She ended up coming to the States, starting to round things out a little bit. Her jiu-jitsu is getting better. Striking is getting better. And you can see that from the time that she was with some of the smaller promotions in Mexico all the way up to her XFL fight for the strawweight title way back about three years ago now against Sarai Sains. She picked up a big win there. But you watch her fight in that fight and then you watch forward to Danielle Taylor. And then you watch forward against Janessa Moranjan. I mean, a huge amount of growth in her game. I mean, 9-1 right now. Maybe she was waiting for a UFC call. She finally gets it. Maybe you would have liked to have seen like a contender series spot. I know she was supposed to fight with Invicta for their strawweight title back at the end of last year against Emily Ducati, who's a great fighter. I mean, call it what it is. Her she's record's been around. Her record's a little salty, but since she came over to Invicta, she's put on some very, very good fights. So it's really kind of funny because for Montserrat Canejo, we looked at her coming into the UFC and it was like, okay, well, she has a really good wrestling pedigree, former champion in Mexico, and she loves the head and arm throws. And then she just head and arm through Cheyenne Bays. They had that weird ending to the fight and it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And for Canejo, she's one of those fighters that you kind of look at her physically. She's five feet tall. You assume maybe she'd be an atom weight. Now she's taking on a fighter with an extra four inches of reach, an extra four inches of height, and Amanda Lemos. And this is somebody that finished a former Invicta champ her last time out in the gangsta, Lavia Souza. She beat Mizuki before that, and then Miranda Granger. And oh, by the way, this is somebody that took years off between fights, went from bantamweight down to strawweight. Her Muay Thai looks on point. Her grappling's on point. She's never been taken down in the UFC, and she's 100% in her takedown attempts. Yeah, I get it. She just turned 31, or sorry, 34. But Amanda Lemos, to me, almost looks like the real deal. She really is. And she's very young in fight years. That's the one thing she does have going for her. Although, yes, she is 34 years old. She hasn't taken that much damage, aside from the Leslie Smith fight. But hey, if you fight Leslie Smith, you're probably going to get damaged throughout that fight. Leslie Smith loves to have some fun fights. The problem that a lot of women are going to have when they do fight Amanda Lemos is that she is so powerful for this weight division. Is Most people just can't have those 50-50 exchanges. For instance, when Jessica I fights, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have noticed this, it's really hard to predict a Jessica I fight, whether win or lose. It's because all of her exchanges are just 50-50. It's just two people coming together. I might land three significant strikes this time. You might land two. And then the other way, it's kind of reversed. It's just a lot of kind of equal exchanges happening. The one thing is that when, a Lam when Amanda Lamos lands on these women, they don't really have an answer for that power. And they can't respond with their own power. So they're eating these long straight shots. And that's the thing too about Lamos. She's not a fighter who has to throw hooks to really get on the inside to then accentuate her own power. She can really snipe from the outside. Even look at back at her last fight against Lavinia Souza. She basically just picks her apart from the outside with the light kicks and with her long range weapons. It's not that Montserrat Ruiz can't win this fight. I think if she could really get her judo going early on and tire out Lemos then maybe there is a path to victory for her. But she's a much smaller fighter. She doesn't really have much by way of striking, so I don't know how she's going to get on the inside. And when you are really good at judo, when you are really good at wrestling, you tend to be very, very heavy on your feet. And when you're fighting someone like Amanda Lemos, who is, I would say, one of the few specialists in the calf and leg kicks in the women's divisions, it's still really hard to ask for Montserrat Ruiz. And, or, Conejo, sorry. And for Conejo, this is the thing. 
Beating Cheyenne Bays doesn't mean you're ready for Amanda Lamos. That's just the honest truth. Like, Cheyenne Bays has a bright future ahead of her, but she's still very green in her MMA career. Amanda Lamos, we talk about her. Yes, she might only have nine fights, but she fights like someone who is much more experienced than she is in her MMA career. Nine wins, 11 fights, both women at 11. And if you look at it for Conejo, just three fights ago, now it was two and a half years ago, she fought Danielle Taylor. She lost that fight, and it was one of those ones where... Taylor had already been in the UFC. She's a very good volume striker, picking people apart on the outside. Then after that, she takes on Janesha Moranjan, ends up finishing her. But again, it's those head and arm throws, head and arm throws. Like, it's crazy to see those. And I thought, Cheyenne Bays, you've been training with Emily Ducati. You're going to get it. But she didn't. Can Amanda Lemos figure that one out? I mean, the odds makers seem to think so. Everybody that put money on her really early on, she opened a minus 250 favorite. She's minus 500 right now. It dropped, and it's been steady. For Conejo, she opened plus 210. She's plus 372 average. And if we have a look at topology, a perfect 1,000 votes, Matt. Wow. 81% Lamos, 69% by decision for the 19% that have uh, Conejo, 80% by decision. I like Amanda Lamos a lot in this fight. I wish I got her at a minus 250. I know there's going to be a lot of support out there for Montserrat, and I hope to see it continue because I do think she's a really interesting fighter. It'll just be, if she's striking in those absolute wars to get into a clinch, she's going to have a really hard time against Lamos. I might be wrong. I'd love to be wrong, actually, in this sense, but I, I do like Lamos in this one quite a bit. I just see Lamos connecting a lot on Ruiz when Ruiz tries to close that distance. Uh, for instance, Marvin Vittori is a great fighter because he just kind of figured out how to strike his way into the clinch. I know it's a very simple thing to say, but it's something that a lot of MMA fighters don't do that good of a job at. Even Yana Kunitskaya, when she fought uh, Irina Aldana, she would bite to every single feint and just kind of rush forward into the clinch. That's the problem. She doesn't have a way to go from long range to close range. Amanda Lamos doesn't have that problem. She can keep the fight at long range, pepper you with her light kicks, pepper you with her straight shots down the middle, and it's just going to be a really hard night for Ruiz to close that distance. I agree with you. I do think there is an avenue for Ruiz. I, I just think it's a very unlikely one, so it's really hard to pick against Amanda Lamos in this fight. Both of us going with Brazil's Amanda Lamos in this fight. I can't wait for it, and man, we've got some big fights coming up. Lamos is former division in the co-main event at Bantamweight. Ooh. You got the return of the cupcake, Matt. Misha Tate, she's going to be taking on Marion Renault. And in the main event, Islam Makachev taking on one tough out in, well, Brazil's Thiago Moises. You're not going to want to miss that. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. Out is Abubakar Nurmagomedov, and in steps the Floridian sensation. We have Preston Parsons, and this is a guy that if you didn't know... You should know because he is an absolute submission specialist. And of his nine wins, Matt, nine of them are by submission. And if you look at some of the losses in his five on in, he's four and one. But his fifth the last fight, he lost to Valdir Arujo, who was 16 and seven at the time and fought a decent level of competition, 23 pro fights. Preston had had six fights. And even before that, he was 19 years old and got knocked out by Mike Perry back in 2015. I don't know what you were doing in 2015. Were you in a bar? Were you in a cage? Were you outside of the venue? Mike Perry was knocking everybody out. And he knocked out Preston Parsons. But for Parsons, it's the absolute buzzsaw that has been the last four fights that he has had. And they've been in quick succession over Wesley Barnes, Socrates Pierre, Wesley Golden, and Jeff Peterson. And that fight just a little over a month ago... He absolutely boxed his ears in, tired him in the first round, get into the second round, got down, had him in his guard, and then got an arm bar. He is an absolute wizard on the ground. You saw that in his fight when he was 20, taking on an 18-year-old, Ignacio Bahamondes, who's now also in the UFC. For Preston Parsons, are the odds stacked against him? Yeah, big time they are, but I want to give another shout out. He is the owner and head coach at Elevate MMA that he founded in 2020 in Jacksonville Beach. This guy is an entrepreneur. Kudos to opening a business during a pandemic, and hopefully it flourishes. I'm sure Jacksonville is going to be proud of Preston Parsons making his debut against one Daniel Rodriguez, who's only lost in the UFC. There are plenty who thought that he won, and maybe he should have lost his fight against Dwight Grant. And maybe he should have lost his fight against Gabe Green, or he was on his way to doing so. But Daniel Rodriguez, a very fun fighter to watch, coming out of the BMF ranch, Matt. I like this fight. It's tricky for... Preston Parsons, but it's a fight that we're going to get nonetheless. It's really tricky for Preston Parsons. Like, let's not make any mistake about it. I know you were hyping him up because that's what we have to do. This is a very, very tough ask for Preston Parsons because if you look at his overall body of work, he's never fought anyone who even comes close to the level of skill that Daniel Rodriguez is. It's just the truth. Like, I like some of the things I've seen out of Preston Parsons against some of the guys we fought, but the issue is that 
I, there was never a fight on the regional scene that I was like, wow, Preston Parsons is going to lose this fight. He went into every fight, A, not only as a favorite, but B, you could just tell that there were levels, and it didn't always feel like he was fighting just a level of competition below where he should have been. But that doesn't mean that you're ready to fight Dana Rodriguez in the UFC. And I know as of recently, we've had a few guys, Terrence McKinney being one of them, who they show up on a week's notice and they win by this flash knockout. It's great. Where they always recently lost, it was a very similar situation. But other than that one flash knockout, it is really hard to beat a guy who, again, Danny Rodriguez can give guys from that, like, 25 to 15 really hard fights who have just been training to fight Danny Rodriguez for the last two months. And the fact that Preston Parsons is doing this on short notice is a really, really hard ask. And when you look at some of the things Parsons struggles with, he does give up defense for offense a lot, especially when he's rushing forward, throwing his own striking combinations, looking for the takedown. He does have a really good takedown, but the issue is that he does get a little wild when he is throwing his strikes on his way to the inside. And yes, his boxing is good when he stays disciplined, but the issue is that he's boxing like 18-year-old Ignacio Bahamondes. You're not boxing Daniel Rodriguez, who is a full-blown man at almost 35. And think about D-Rod. He's going to have fights probably be closer than they should be. He is one of those weird, like, 50-50 fighters where, listen, I, I, I'll i speak for you as well. I like watching D-Rod fight. He doesn't have boring fights. They tend to be very exciting. But the fact that he does leave his chin very wide open when he lands his own power shots is a little bit concerning. Like, D-Rod probably has nightmares about guys like Vicente Luque at night who can absorb your big power, keep things really clean, and counter you down the middle. But... We're talking about guys like Vicente Luque giving him trouble like that. I just think for a guy like Preston Parsons, making your UFC debut, this is a good way to get your foot in the door, but it's going to be really hard to start your UFC career off with a win against a really hot, tough out like D-Rod. If you're playing MMA math, Daniel Rodriguez just beat Mike Perry, and 19-year-old Preston Parsons couldn't, so Daniel Rodriguez is going to win, but no, you can't look at it that way. For Parsons, though, you know how good the jiu-jitsu is? It was funny to me, too, because doing the background research for one, you go back and watch that Bahamundas fight. That one's on Fight Pass, but all of his previous four fights that he's had with combat night and i don't understand it i didn't have it actually in my notes but the last one the name of the show was just duval like did they like the movie true oh. grit did they like like to kill a mockingbird or the big robert du did they like kicking and screaming with mike ditka like duval do better but for preston parsons really good boxing again a lot of power on those shots. I'm not going to say really good boxing. I'll say passable boxing into the clinch. It's tidy, but a lot of power on his shots. The other thing that he has, nice elbows in the clinch. We saw that. And the thing that I've noticed watching fight over fight over fight for Preston Parsons, a lot more kicks too. And a lot of head kicks, that's going to cause him issues against the southpaw and Daniel Rodriguez. And for Rodriguez... You're getting ready for Abubakar and Magomedov. Now, Abubakar looked amazing in his fight against Jared Gooden because what did he do? Well, Jared thinks that I'm going to wrestle him and take him down. I'm just going to strike with him. And he looked amazing in that one. For Rodriguez, though, I think we're a few steps ahead. We're still going to train some of that wrestling defense in order to flow with our striking. Rodriguez is a good fighter in that way. Now, like I said, short notice opponent Gabe Green gave him a really good fight. He did. And he has had some interesting ones. I thought that he won the Dolby fight. I was pretty surprised that way, and I joke at the start because in the Dwight Grant fight, Grant pretty much had him finished, but War Tyone let it go, and then it but ends here, up. No, no, that's not a negative for Dana Rodriguez. We can't talk about that like it's a negative. No, no, the fact that he fought through that situation against a guy like Dwight Grant is an extreme positive. Like I feel like we talk about that situation far too negatively. The fact that he was able to eat Dwight Grant's best shot and then come back and knock him out is pretty impressive. It was insane. So we'll see what happens coming up this weekend. When I look at it for Dana Rodriguez. He's about a minus 225 favorite or thereabouts. And if you look at it opposite him, we're not in Chris Moutinho territory, but for Preston Parsons, he's coming in about a plus 207. Open a plus 175, he's a plus 207. For Rodriguez, open a minus 225, he's actually a minus 259. If we have a look at the topology votes, they're a surprise to us as they are to you. Yeah. There are 837 total votes, 92% Rodriguez, 71% by knockout. For Parsons, the 8% that have him, 49% by uh, submission. Again, he is a submission specialist. Go check out Elevate MMA if you're in the Jacksonville area. We'll pump his tires that way. But when I look at this fight, I've seen Parsons get hit by a lot of left-handed shots. Where Rodriguez's best shot is at his left shovel hook. There's a lot of good shots that he throws from that southpaw stance. A lot of kicks too. Could they be caught? Could he get taken down? Possibly. But I do like D-Rod in this fight for sure. Yeah, I just think Rodriguez is much more advanced in his MMA career. And for, per for Preston Parsons, like, this is a good way to get your foot in the door. I just think D-Rod is a little bit too much too soon. Both of us going with Daniel Rodriguez in this one, Matt. We have an interesting main card coming up shortly. Topped off 
Oh. At lightweight, you got Islam Makhachev taking on Tiago Moises. You're not going to want to miss that. Keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. I know this is a fight that a lot of fans have circled on their calendar. Coming up this weekend at Featherweight, we have Billy Corintillo. He's taking on Gabriel Benitez who's a fan favorite in the Fight Night Picks universe. And you go back and you look at Gabriel Benitez's last fight. Well, I think he took Justin Jane's spine out of his back with a crazy knee up the middle. And then for Benitez, well, we expected to see him back not that long ago. He's supposed to be taking on Jonathan Pierce, a guy who, I mean, who the hell knows what Jonathan Pierce is like. Sometimes he's getting finished by Joe Lozon. Sometimes he's styling on Kai Kamaka. It was tough. Now, I put it up in the graphic that you're going to see next to us, the fact that Gabriel Benitez, if you look on Topology, it says his latest weight, 155.5. He's a guy that's bounced around before. He's had some interesting fights, but really, his home is at featherweight. Only weighed 150.5 for his fight against Jonathan Pierce, and Jonathan said, no. I mean, come to fight, and come to make the weight, and then we'll fight. And for Jonathan Pierce, well, we haven't seen him back in the UFC since, and this wasn't all that long ago. But for Benitez, he gets a quick turnaround. He's going to be taking on Billy Q, who just tasted his first bit of defeat in his last fight. He was supposed to take on Gavin Tucker a few different times in 2020. Coronavirus started. Billy got it in the summer. Then we end up with a fight. And he didn't look very good against Gavin Tucker. He didn't. And it was a really unique performance from Billy Q because he didn't really do any of the things that we know him for. Like when I think of Billy Corantillo, I don't really think about, you know, power or extreme volume, but, or I shouldn't say that. I don't really think about extreme power, but I do think about just his absurd level of volume and the way that his cardio normally can get him through really tough fights. But that wasn't the case whatsoever against Gavin Tucker. He was really on, it felt like he was just reacting to what Gavin Tucker did. He was never the one moving forward. He was getting backed up. He was getting taken down. It was just a really uncharacteristic performance from Billy Quarantillo. And that's why this fight against Gabriel Benitez will be so interesting. I think Benitez is going to have success in some of the areas that Gavin Tucker did. Of course, Benitez isn't the wrestler that Tucker is, but it was weird that Tucker had as much success on the feet as he did against Billy Q because for Billy Q I I think he's a good but not great striker but honestly that last performance kind of took him down another notch in my mind I understand that you might have some reservations about Gabriel Benitez and the weight miss and whatnot but in my mind if we're getting both guys at 100% if I'm getting the best version of Billy Q versus the best version of Gabriel Benitez at 145 pounds I'm honestly finding it really hard to find ways of how Billy Q could beat him at 145. My question really comes down to, can Benitez still safely make the weight at 145? And how dedicated was he really to this whole game plan and to this training camp? It really is tricky. I mean, Gabriel Benitez is one of those guys that actually leads the featherweight division in significant strike defense at 71.4%. That's a number that you absolutely love to see from a primary striker who's a southpaw that throws wicked body kicks. And leg kicks to the point where, listen, will his shin leak a little bit? Yeah, a la Mark Hunt. You love to see it. But I look at this. I wrote down a lot in terms of notes. He actually combined for featherweight and lightweight as a 70.5% uh, clip in terms of significant strike defense. Dang. If you consider even that combined, that's actually eighth all-time period regardless of weight class. So... That just shows you how good his significant strike defense is. Six and four so far in the UFC. Maybe not the most glamorous clip. He was booked again, like I said, in May. It was supposed to be that fight against Jonathan Pierce. And for Billy Quarantillo, I don't know. He was probably looking forward to fighting Canadians for the longest time. He was actually 3-0 going into the fight against Gavin Tucker. He had a win over Matt DiMarcantonio that we saw fight at Fight... What was it? Fight Legend... Fight League Atlantic? Not Fight League Atlantic. No. Sorry, Cat. It was FA Legends. It was a weird card, but Matt DiMarcantonio fought in the main event. He had fought Billy Quarantillo and lost. Kyle Nelson, the other name, and Adrian Valeca, a guy that actually trains with uh, some big names, the Gary Roberts team that trains Connor McDavid in hockey off the ice. So some cool stuff in terms of Billy Q, but a guy coming, us, coming to us from Gracie Baja, Tampa. He's trained quite a bit with Matt Frivola. You see those two guys palling around. Coming into this fight, I look at the odds. Gabriel Benitez open a plus 115 underdog. He's actually a minus 190 favorite right now. If you look at it for Billy Q, open a minus 135 favorite. He's now a plus 156 underdog. And when I look at it over on Topology, 950 total votes, 75% Quarantillo, 80% by decision. For the 25% that have Benitez, 67% by decision. To me, as far as Billy Q is concerned, if he's passed any of the tiredness issues, if he's really worked on his cardio the last number of months, because you have to factor in, the Gavin Tucker fight was six months ago. We haven't seen him in quite some time before that. Wins over Kyle Nelson, where he finished him. Spike Carlisle, where he outlasted him. 
Jacob Kilburn, whose UFC run was, was very like three subpar fighters, correct? was very difficult. Gabriel Benitez, you're looking at the five on in. I know there's big wins over Umberto Bandanai, Jason Knight, the losses, Sadiq Youssef, Omar Morales. That one was at 55, and then moved back down and fought Justin James, where it was just absolute sicko mode in that fight. I love the striking out of Benitez as a complete package. I do still like the cardio out of Billy Q. I think that fight against Gavin Tucker, it was style for style. Tucker had his number that night. That's what makes this fight so interesting. Do we get the norm out of Billy Q? Was that a one-off? And for Gabriel Benitez, is the weight cut an issue now moving back down to featherweight? Well, the norm for Billy Q, the, uh, the issue is that he's going to eat a lot of damage in this fight. The problem is he's going to be eating damage until he can get his hands around Gabriel Benitez. And the issue is that Benitez, who does invest in leg and body shots a lot in the first round, even if Billy Q does have better cardio, he won't by the time the third round comes around because of all the damage to the leg and the bodies that he will absorb. Like, if Gavin Tucker can have success with the leg kick against you, then Gabriel Benitez is going to destroy your legs. And there's really no other way of saying it because I think Gavin Tucker is a very complete striker. He can throw a lot of different things at you, but he's not the specialist in Muay Thai that Benitez is. And I really do think that the calf kick of Benitez and the body shots are really going to add up as this fight goes on. Unless we do get something weird weight cut wise, I might switch my pick when it does come down to question mark kicks. But as of right now, I actually do like Gabriel Benitez. That's the thing. When Javier Mendez says you're the best guy at kicking that he's ever seen and I'm surprised he didn't say that about like Habib because listen I mean he just defends him all the time but I do like Gabriel Benitez as well in this fight but again just like with the JSP fight just like Billy Q with Gavin Tucker I want to see these guys on the scale facing off and then I'll make the final prediction so you're gonna have to wait till Saturday to get an official outlook on this one but for right now both of us going with Mexico's Gabriel Benitez and Matt we have a really interesting fight on this card up a weight class in the main event Islam Makachev taking on Tiago Moises you're not gonna want to miss that so keep locked in with fight night picks and as we always say let's, let's get, get into it, it. At Fight Night Picks in the past, we've been wrong. So, it would be the cat's rear end if Anthony Hernandez goes out there and shocks the world. Listen, I would be incredibly high on Anthony Hernandez from here on out. Like, he would be my guy. But I'm going with Adolfo Vieira in this fight. Renish has one way to win this fight. Yes, he's a third degree black belt jiu-jitsu. Yes, he's great on the mat. I'm telling you this right now. It's not like Jacques Array is like a Adolfo Vieira, where I'm worried that he's going to get tired and that there's a world out there where Jacques Array could get submitted. I'm telling you this right now. Jacques Array is not going to get submitted by Andrea Muniz. There is not a world, there is not any situation where Muniz outgrapples Jacques Array in this fight. But I never thought we'd come to the day where the guy that's featured in our video promo pack, Matt going, I can guarantee you one thing, Adolfo Vieira is going to submit Saperbeg Safarov. It happened. Adolfo Vieira's nickname, they don't really mention as much in the UFC, but Joe Rogan will, is the fact that he is the black belt hunter. And this is one of the most accredited jiu-jitsu players you're going to find in MMA. Oh, by the way, fluffy Anthony Hernandez submitted him in his last fight. It's absolutely insane. It's a stat that's going to live with him for the rest of his life. But there's one main reason why. Anthony Hernandez, oddly enough, unless he's fighting like a Jordan Wright, has weird staying power. Great defensive jiu-jitsu. Good cardio. And good cardio when he's a young man. For Adolfo Vieira, if you get past the first half of the first round, he is the 31-year-old that looks the most like an 81-year-old after that point. And I could not imagine, I could not believe how bad it looked after that. And the comments section filled up, and rightfully so, because I was totally wrong. It was amazing how bad Vieira looked after he couldn't submit Hernandez in that fight. George Patton had a quote after World War II, and it was that fatigue makes cowards of us all. And that really just defines Hadolfo Vieira his last time out. I know we both had not only high hopes for him in his last performance, but just kind of moving forward. This is a guy who is not only known for his jiu-jitsu, but is known for submitting other jiu-jitsu aces. Like, you don't get a nickname like the Black Belt Hunter by being okay on the mats against a bunch of blue belts. And the fact that... It wasn't the fact that he got out grappled in his last fight. That's fine. You can get out grappled and then get better at grappling and then we'll see a different version of you. It's the fact that he gave up in his last fight. That really is the important thing. Like, in MMA, the one thing that you have to have is heart. Like, when the fight gets tough, this is always my Cyril Gaon thing. I know Craig rolls his eyes, but it's very true. Cyril Gaon, you can't have a bunch of confidence behind a lot of his performances because he's never faced adversity yet. And trust me, he's finally got... 
He hadn't. And he's finally got to the point now where I'm a lot more confident in his overall game. But there is a case where there's a lot of fighters, even Shane Carwin, for instance. Shane Carwin had the crazy stat where it was all of his fights end by first round knockout. That's great. But what happens when your fight doesn't end by first round knockout? What happens when you do have to go to plan B, plan C, plan D? There's guys out there like, for instance, Israel Adesanya, John Jones, Daniel Cormier, where it doesn't really matter what you throw at them. They're going to figure it out as they move along. And there's a reason why those guys are all champions. The fact that when Hadolfo Vieira faced any sort of adversity whatsoever in the cage, he just gave up is a really big issue that I have. And it's weird because against Dustin Stutzfuss, who has good jiu-jitsu of his own, it will be weird because I don't think Dustin's going to go out there and submit Hadolfo Vieira. Trust me, I've made statements like that before and they have come back to bite me. But it really does feel like every single Hadolfo Vieira fight comes down to, can he submit his opponent before, the, before he gets tired? The problem is that he gets tired, what, 90 seconds? Trust me, his jiu-jitsu is great. His, his wrestling complements his jiu-jitsu so well because to me, when he came into the UFC, it was, this guy's going to blast double legs and take guys down. We went back and watched him coming into the UFC. He fought with ACA. The Vitaly Nemchinov submission wins. He just kind of like runs in, takes him down, submits him, gets his back. And then he comes into the UFC and it's like, okay, he's going to be taking on Oscar Piotta. Didn't really have the greatest run. I mean, he made Marc-Andre Barrio look like a guy that's going to challenge for the title tomorrow. Finishes him, and then he takes on our guy, Saperbeg Safarov, one of the worst, worst runs Saffron. in the UFC. And he finishes him, and it's like, wow. To me, I'm not joking. I thought Adolfo Vieira was going to become a top 15 talent. I thought he was going to creep right up. I thought, man, this is one of those lone specialists that's going to go all the way. And I had so much stock riding in him. Now that's gone. Let's throw it back to our preview of Pennsylvania Zone, who trains in Germany, Dustin Streitzfutz, because we painted a lovely little picture before his UFC debut. But and I mean, for Dustin Streitzfutz making his uh, UFC debut, a guy coming in off of Dana White Contender Series this past summer, he got a first round win over Joseph Pfeiffer in a bit of a non-starter of a fight. It was kind of a disappointment. Pfeiffer breaking his arm. It was gross. It kind of sucked. But hey, you get your opportunity in the UFC. I mean, he's 13-1. And you look at the wins. He beats Nihad Nasifovic uh, at GMC3. Guy's record was 9-4, and four, nothing to shake his stick at. But if you go back and watch that fight, Stoichfus really set things up on the feet. He was throwing those nice hooks. He was whipping them with those kicks. And the thing with Dustin Stoichfus, he'll throw the kicks everywhere. It's not like he's just landing a calf kick every time. He'll aim for your knee. He'll aim for your thigh. Because like you said, he's not afraid to get taken down. You know how good of a submission game he has. And he got a third round twister in that one. Pretty darn cool. Wow. Bryce Mitchell, Korean Zombie. Hey, keep it on lock. I know he's, what, 40 pounds heavier than both of those guys. But still, keep it on lock. But the fight that I really like for Dustin Stoisfutz was the fight against Jonas Bilstein. And in that fight, GMC 20, you might recognize Jonas uh, from fighting Alexander Slomenko and getting finished. And then Frolov and getting finished. And then Stoisfutz and getting finished. But hey, Jonas Bilstein is a really good type of litmus test for me to see if, hey, if you beat him, you can probably kick yeah. it in one of the bigger promotions. I mean, yeah, it took uh, Stoisfus two more fights to make it here, but he gets a big win there in a fight against a guy that can definitely kickbox. He's throwing those crazy kicks. He's mixing in some combinations. He switched stances very well. He rocked him in that first round. He gets taken down. He's grabbing the uh, guillotine, and then the round ends, and he goes in there and throws a wild right hand that absolutely springboards his opponent in that one. Stoisfitz, you know he's great on the feet. You know his jiu-jitsu is certainly there. And you look at his total wins, and I mean, this is a guy, you can't take it from him. He's the We Love MMA middleweight champ. We love MMA. Yeah. And he's their middleweight champ. So for Dustin Stoisfitz, this is a guy that can throw a lot of kicks, a lot of power moves. We've seen his defensive grappling tested in the past, but overall, it was able to hold up. Now, he took on Kyle Dawkins' last time out. One of the judges, Michael Bell, not Chris... Not Chris, but Michael Bell, 30-26. Junichiro Camillo, 30-27. Tony Weeks, 30-27. MMA decisions, the majority had it 30-27. 129-27 and a couple of 30-26s. I had it 30-27. I actually had really high hopes for Dustin Stoisfitz, the former We Heart MMA champ coming into that fight. But overall, very complete fighter. Maybe a little late getting to the dance, even though he was 13-1 going into that fight. But overall, I really like his game. So the big question is, obviously, can he outlast Vieira in this one? <sighs> I can't believe I'm saying this, Craig. 
I think Adolfo Vieira can at least get an early takedown in this fight, if nothing else. Now, will that early takedown be uh, solidify the win for him, or will that early takedown force him to work, which is something you never want Adolfo Vieira to do in his fights, and force him to get tired as the fight goes on? Personally, I think we saw the worst version of Adolfo Vieira his last time out, and I really do think he can only go up from there. I understand getting submitted when your nickname is the Black Belt Hunter is going to leave a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths, but I can't honestly tell you that I think he's going to look worse than he did his last time out. So against my better judgment, I am actually going to pick Adolfo Vieira in this fight. Adolfo Vieira open a minus 210 favorite. He's minus 234 on best fight odds. Dustin Streisfuss open a plus 180. He's roughly a plus 189 right now. Over on Topology, 1,054 total votes, 79% Vieira, 85% by submission, 21% that have Streisfuss, 46 roughly percent have him to win by knockout. I'm not normally one to just go totally off script with a hype train. I'm totally off it right now. Wow. You can't improve your cardio that well in four months if you're that big of a guy at 185 pounds. I know what I'm getting out of Stoitzfus. In terms of the way that they match up height and reach-wise, Stoitzfus actually has an advantage in terms of the reach. Height-wise, they're about the same. Obviously, Hadolfo's like a brick shit house out is. there. But I do like Dustin Stoisfus in terms of his staying power. And I think once we get into the second, third round, this fight is definitely his. I've seen him strike with kickboxers. I've seen him fight grapplers in the past. His last time out didn't go well against Dawkins, who's more multifaceted, has the cardio and staying power and the straight shots. I like Stoichfist in this fight. This is the only pushback I'll have. I don't disagree with you picking Stoichfist in this fight. I don't know what his staying power in the UFC really is. Because if you look at what Kyle Dawkins is at middleweight, he's a good but not great fighter. And I do really feel like we saw the limitations of Stoichfist in that fight. Because, like you said, he can strike with kickboxers. He can wrestle with wrestlers. But at a certain point, the people who do have the advantages over him tend to win out in their own specialty. So, I, I don't disagree with your pick in this one. But I do... I'm curious to see where his ceiling is in the division as a whole and i guess we are gonna learn a lot this weekend the guys who are better than him in his specialties he's 13 and 2 his only losses to christian skorzik back in 2015 just the, listen when you're billed as a grappler and you get out grappled and i understand it's what happened to hadolfo vieira as well but hadolfo got tired and then got out grappled stoichfish was fine and still got out grappled against Dawkins. again it really does come down to do you think vieira is going to submit him in the first round or do you think dustin's going to outlast that first round all right matt well we're split on that yeah. one so you've got Adolfo Vieira to get the win I'm going with Dustin Streisfuss to get the win you let us know down below in the comments section who's getting this win I want to know Matt wants to know we'll have a poll coming up later on in the week before question mark kicks you can check that out at fight night picks over on Instagram if you're not already there it's a great what time. What are you doing? What are you doing? We got a big time main event coming up this weekend. Islam Makachev taking on Tiago Moises. You're not going to want to miss that. Let's keep it locked in with Fight Name Picks as we always say. Let's, Let's get, get into it. it. Big time fight coming up this weekend at Lightweight. This is an all-timer. You have the little okay. heathen, Jeremy Stevens. Now, don't do that at the weigh-ins. They won't allow it anymore. He's taking on Matoush Gamrot. Gamer is the nickname, former KSW lightweight champ from 2016 to 2020. And this is a guy that it was like, listen, he's been knocking on the UFC's door for a long time. And sometimes you see champions with other organizations. I know Reiner DeRitter is a guy that I'd like to see in the UFC at some point. Ang Lan Sung was one of those guys until Reiner came along and took everything he worked for. But there's lots of great champions in other organizations that you'd love to see inserted into the UFC. For Matoush Gamrot. Fight of the night in a split decision loss against Guram Kutateladze. And his last time out, a performance of the night against one Scott Holtzman. Scott Holtzman, what's he known for? Playing hockey and effing guys up with his boxing. And in that fight, Scott landed some nice uppercuts up the middle. But it was the movement of Matoush Gamrot that really freaked him out. Couldn't figure out that puzzle. He'd kind of touch him up top. Then he'd go down. He'd go for the ankle pick. He had a couple of really low ankle takedowns where he threw him back. Got them. Maybe he was credited for them. Maybe he wasn't. UFC stats is really weird. But in that fight, right cross that dropped Scott Holtzman. That was pretty much all she wrote. This guy is a special specimen. He's bred in five rounds. He's been in some absolute wars. And he's taken on a guy that always brings on a great fight in Jeremy Stevens. And Dracar Close, if you're out there... Hopefully you're doing well. Win, lose, or draw, or really, no matter what your personal opinion is of Jeremy Stevens, he does come to fight. And that's one of the few guarantees that I really do have on this fight card. Like, he's going to move forward, and he's going to throw big bombs. And against a guy like Mateusz Gamrat, it'll be interesting because... 
If Gamrot has any weakness in his game, I would say it is his durability. He's not a guy like a Dustin Poirier or like a Justin Gaethje in this division where it's like, okay, they can just walk through pretty much whatever they get hit with and then respond with their own power. We did see in that Gurom fight, and listen, Gurom Kutatalanse is like the dark horse of this division. There's a reason nobody wants to fight him. It's because he's super dynamic and he is a massive fighter for this weight class. But the one disturbing thing that happened in their fight was when Gurom was able to defend the takedown attempts of Gamrot and when he was able to land clean, he would hurt Gamrot to the point where he dropped him. I know the UFC stats only gives him credit for one, but he did hurt him on multiple occasions throughout that fight. And it was an interesting fight because it feels like the majority of the time that we're talking about Gamrot, we're talking about how good his striking is, his ability to switch stances, his ability to have not only power from both sides, but his ability to really just kind of be the same fighter from both stances. We don't even talk about how good his wrestling is. And I know you kind of pointed to it a little bit in the ho in the Holtzman fight. The only reason he was in the Gurom fight was because of his wrestling and the fact that when he does have to just fall back, on that like okay the striking's not working out great for me do I have to go back to my roots as a wrestler it works out well for him and it was a really big talking point I know Daniel Cormier brought it up as to when okay he lost to Gurom then he went to American Top Team he was already a great fighter before that, and now he's training with guys like Mike Brown, like Jorge Masvidal, like Dustin Poirier. You're only going to get better after that. The crazy thing about Matos Gamrot is when you look at those fighters that he's training with and you go on Instagram, you can play the Instagram game. It's weird. It's usually, again, people are pretty, you know, vague about what they're doing, and they're usually pretty self-involved. But when I see, like, Dustin Poirier and Masvidal and other fighters at ATT going, hey... I'm taking a picture with oh, Mateusz so Gamrot. That's a great thing to see. And they're excited to be training with him. He's ADCC tested. He's got the wrestling and he can bring it on the feet. It's really impressive. But again, Jeremy Stevens does have that nuclear option, which has caused Gamrot issues in the past. And listen, I'll throw myself under the bus. I probably think Jeremy Stevens is at least like 10 to 20% better than he is because I do like like the war Jeremy Stevens factor. And I know I brought it up in the D-Rod fight where he will make fights closer than they have to be. Jeremy Stevens' recklessness will make the skill gap closer than it probably should be. Like, I think Mateusz Gamrot is he a more uh, technical striker than Jeremy Stevens without a doubt. Can he fight from both stances? He's throwing more kicks. Yes. He's the much more polished fighter. But even at 155 pounds, you have to remember, Jeremy Stevens knocked out Rafael Dos Anjos at this weight class. Like, he's not just a powerful puncher at featherweight. He's a guy whose power does translate across multiple weight classes. And that's the only little hesitation I have with being hardcore, oh, Gamerot's going to win this fight. The fact that Jeremy Stevens can land shots with weird power in weird situations can happen. And I, I know you're about to bring it up. That fight happened when I was in grade five. So it was a while ago. But Jeremy Stevens, always does have that 1% chance to land a big hook and it's something you always do have to take into consideration. Jimmy Stevens knocked out Dos Anjos at UFC 91. Couture versus Lesnar knockout of the night back in November of 2008. Wow. And since then, yeah, you definitely don't love the five on in. I blasted out there, but Jose Aldo, Zabit, Yair Rodriguez, Calvin Cater, all top 10 level fighters at featherweight. Obviously for Aldo, he's down at Bantamweight now and the Yair Rodriguez no contest. The eye scratch, he had to put the sunglasses on. That was just really weird. He's supposed to fight Arnold Allen back in November of Which last year. Which would have been a great fight. Stevens bowed out due to injury. He was supposed to fight Dracar close. And then he pushed him at the ceremonial weigh-ins or after the, the weigh-ins. And it was weird. And this Face is what off. I want to bring up. The UFC, again, I talked about this with Sean O'Malley last weekend. This is a very boxing UFC fight where it's like, hey, you're in the co-main event with your car close. We're going to give you a big opportunity on a card and then you're going to throw it away. Well, now you fight Mateusz Gamrot, who although has a lot of the strengths that Dracar Close has, also has a much more well-rounded game than Dracar Close. Like, Close is a great striker, but he's not really going to go out there shooting double legs into single legs and really throwing in a lot of wrestling transitions, whereas Gamrot, he will play the striking game with Jeremy Stevens. And if Jeremy Stevens even lands one decent shot on the feet, I do see Gamrot just immediately going into wrestling mode, and I just don't think Jeremy Stevens can keep up with the overall game of Mateusz Gamrot. 65% takedown defense for Jeremy Stevens. He's been in the UFC for eons. If you have a look at the odds for this, one for Matash Gamrot. Open to minus 170. Wish I got him then. Minus 229 right now for Jeremy Stevens. He opened at a plus 145. He's a plus 184. And if you have a look over at the topology votes, surprised us there to you. 1,075 total votes. 88% Gamrot. 48% by decision. 43% by knockout. For the 12% that have Stevens, 70% by knockout. If you like Jeremy Stevens, probably going to be by knockout again. When Gamrot goes down and drops levels, even Holtzman was able to time some of those uppercuts. He is a boxer as well, but he must weigh like the middleweight limit when he steps in. He's huge. They always talk about it. 
but even poor Scott Holtzman gets hit, a la Benil Dariush. When I look at this fight, Jeremy Stevens has only lost upper echelon guys, while Gamrot's not in the top 15 or that near it. I'd say he's getting close, but he's not that near it. I think Mateusz Gamrot has a great opportunity in this fight, and I'm definitely back in the Polish fighter here. Yeah, I like Gamrot quite a bit. And for Stevens, I think he can make this a fun fight. It's just, I'm grasping straws and looking at ways that he can win. I, I agree. He does have a good uppercut, and if you do watch Gamrot's fights, he can be susceptible to some of those attacks coming up the middle. But even the ones that Holtzman landed on him, they weren't that clean. Like, Gamrot does have a good way of kind of hiding his head in those weird kind of... He shoots too far away. That's the one thing that I... That's the one critique I have on Game Rats Game where he does have really good footwork himself on the feet. But the problem is, is it's almost a double-edged sword where he moves so much when he does try to initiate his own wrestling. He's shooting in from six, seven feet away. And against upper echelon guys, like we bring up the Gaethje's of the division. Like against those guys, you should probably fix that one hole in your game. But I don't think that's going to be an issue against a guy like Jeremy Stevens moving up a weight class to take on Game Rats. Both of us going with Poland's Mateusz Game Rat. Can't wait for the fight in our co -main event marion renault misha tate in her main event islam makachev taking on tiago moises you're not going to want to miss it keep it locked in with fight night picks and as we always say let's, let's get, get into it. it summer's coming are you ready to unveil your beach bod you're in luck our friends at manscape they just launched their fourth generation performance package and it includes somewhere in this bag the lawnmower 4.0 you heard that right the 4.0 Compliment your summer bod with a trim from the leaders of male grooming. The sun is shining. Calling your name, fellas. Join the over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped. Get ready for hot guy summer by going to manscaped.com. You're going to get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code FNP. Now, Matt, we've all been there. This thing works incredibly well. Now, I've always been a shower shaver. And if you're a shower shaver, what's the number one issue? Not enough light. Not enough light, exactly. There's not many people who have the spotlights in your shower unless you live at a hotel or you're very ritzy. And if so, good on you. And I'm not that ritzy. So for me, partnering up with Manscaped was a great idea. Now, we happen to have the partnership back in December. Enough of you have checked them out. And when you help our sponsors, you're helping us as well. So we've been able to partner up for Manscaped for the past, what, six months? It's been a while now. It's been a lot of fun as well. And with the 4.0 and the Performance Package 4.0, there's lots of great stuff you can do. I'm going to be traveling. I was traveling a little bit last week. I'm going to travel a little bit this week. This sucker is great because there's nothing worse than if you bring your trimmer with you and I face trimmer, whatever it is, you don't have what these guys have. Tap that button. One, two, three. I can see the lights going up. Now the travel lock's on. This is in my bag. I hit that button. I'm not going to mess around with it. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three, you see the light go, and now all of a sudden, boom, 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 there you go. It's working the very best. So just hit it three times, the travel lock turns off, and it works great. And it's really nice, too, because it's got the ceramic age blade. Edge, age, whatever it is, that's also great. Now, if you get that performance package 4.0, you're going to get the weed whacker. Matt, what do I have a problem with? Nose hair, and a very severe one at that. That's the only thing? That's pretty good. Nice. The best part about the Weed Whacker. Now, I've been growing that out for a little bit, and it actually needs to be done, so that's what I'm going to be doing later on tonight. But the Weed Whacker, it's also a great part to round out your gr grooming game. You can toss that in your ear if you have ear hair. I personally don't yet knock wood, but my eyebrows are starting to get a little squirrely. Next is going to be the ear hair. If you get the Performance Package 4.0, you also get the Crop Reviver. This one's a ball toner. Tss, tss, Spritz a little bit on in the morning if you want a little bit of a pick-me-up. If you really want to pick-me-up, it's going to last all day. The Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, it's like a salve. Just lather it on. Slap that stuff on. It's going to work the very best. So make sure you check them out. If you do pick up the Performance Package 4.0, Manscaped's thrown in a couple of different gifts. They've got the Shed Travel Bag. Everybody needs a nice toiletry bag when they're traveling. I personally use this one when I go out on the road. They're also going to give you a great ad in the Manscaped boxers. I'm wearing them right now, and they are very comfortable. So make sure you check them out to get 20% off and free shipping. It's manscaped.com. You're going to want to use the promo code FNP to let them know that we sent you. You're helping them. You're helping us. It works the very best. It's 20% off and free shipping with code FNP at manscaped.com. Escape the shrubs and weeds this summer and shine with Manscaped. Matt, we got some big fights coming up at the top of this card. You're not going to want to miss them. So as we always say with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it. We have a co-main event coming up this weekend that I can't figure out. Matt can't figure out. Maybe you can tell us. We have 
The Belizean Bruiser, Marion Renault, she's going to be taking on Cupcake Misha Tate, the former One Championship VP. She joined the crew back in 2018. She left not that long ago to pursue the comeback in the UFC. But if you look at it for Misha Tate, former women's bantamweight champ, she was able to get a huge win over Holly Holm right after Holm had beat Ronda Rousey. Boom. It was the trading of the hands of the title. Until Misha Tate went on in her next fight to take on Amanda Nunes, she lost and Nunes has been champ ever since. That was four years and 11 months ago. She would then go on a few months later to lose to Raquel Pennington by decision and retire. And at the time, she was, what, 29 years old? She was 18 and 7. You're fairly long in the tooth. You go down through Misha Tate's record. It's a murderer's row, some might say. Jess Guy, Sarah McMahon, Rin Nakai, Liz Carmouche, Ronda Rossi, Kat Zingano, Julie Kedzie, Ronda Rousey, and you go all the way down through Sarah Kaufman, Caitlin Young in her debut, Jan Finney after that. These are pioneers of the sport and names that you should definitely know. Not to say that Marion Renault hasn't fought good names. She has. I mean, yeah, her record might not be the best, but still, she's fought big names. The five on in, one and four, not the best. But for Misha Tate, I haven't seen her fight in a cage in four years and seven months, and I have... No idea what she's been doing other than looking Shred City on Instagram and not being the one championship VP anymore. So sometimes you have to look at the past to predict the future. And let's just kind of break down why Misha Tate left in the first place. So she gets a weird Uriah Faber title shot because here's the thing. Jessica I had lost so many fights at Bantamweight and Misha Tate beats her one time at Bantamweight and immediately gets the title shot. Now I understand the UFC wasn't in a hurry to put uh, Ronda Rousey back in there with Holly Holm. They wanted to give Ronda Rousey some time off and then I'm doing Misha Tate versus Holly Holm, which is an interesting fight. And I, I guess I'll speak more on that here in a couple minutes, but if you look at her last two fights in the promotion, she is the headliner of UFC 200, one of the biggest cards in UFC's history, against Amanda Nunes. And listen, if you guys are watching our videos, then you probably know who Amanda Nunes is. She is not only the greatest women's fighter ever, arguably just the best fighter ever, regardless of gender at this point. So Misha Tate gets absolutely brutalized in that fight. And that is one of those fights where you can't really take many positives from it in the Misha Tate corner. She lands a couple jabs, but gets all of her takedowns denied. And on the feet... You can probably assume what happens when Amanda Nunes boxes in Misha Tate. Breaks her nose, takes her down, chokes her out. A very dominant performance from Amanda Nunes. And then Misha Tate goes out there and fights Raquel Pennington. Which, I don't care what your opinion of Raquel Pennington is. She's very mid-tier in this division. I understand she has had a title shot. But Raquel Pennington really is a win-one-lose-one kind of fighter. Especially as the top tier of this division. And she had her way with Misha Tate in that fight. So I guess the question I really have on Misha Tate's return is. Why is she coming back? Because I know... There's a lot of fighters who say this. They go, I'm only going to be in the UFC for as long as I can believe I can become champ one day. Does Misha Tate, is she coming back because she thinks that, okay, I can become champion? Is she looking at the top of the division with the Jermaine Durandamies and the Holly Holmes and she thinks, okay, well, they're primary strikers. My bread and butter really is my wrestling game. Maybe I can offer a unique stylistic matchup to those top fighters. The issue is that this road always brings you back to Amanda Nunes. And I'm sorry, I don't care if Misha Tate was doing nothing but training with like a prime Manny Pacquiao and Conor McGregor and Anderson Silva in this weird time machine for the last five years. She's not going to beat Amanda Nunes. So if Misha Tate's coming back, has she realized that, okay, I'm at the stage of my career where I can come back and be like an Arturo Gotti, like I have a big name and I can be more of an action fighter. That wouldn't make a lot of sense because that's not really what she was known as before she ever became champion, before she retired. I guess, I guess this question really just goes over to you. Why is Misha Tate coming back? Because I can think of a lot of reasons, but none of them are that great. It's probably to be a ranked bandweight, to have really big fights, and then ultimately try and find your path back to the title to see if you can make it back that far. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of answers throughout fight week. We're going to find out on media day. We're going to see both of these two at weigh-in day, and I cannot stress enough. Misha Tate physically looks absolutely amazing. She's in the best shape I think I've ever seen her, period. She's taking on Marion Renault. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. 18-7 and 7 for Misha Tate, former champ. She's fought big names. She's 34, almost 35. She's two months away. Well, really, she's a month away from turning 35. Marion Renault just turned 44. And I don't know any tougher gym teachers than Marion Renault at 44, Matt. We grew up with a parent who was a gym we teacher. Did. I don't think he could have fought this high level of fighter. Hell, even when he was 30, let alone 44. But if you look at it for Marion Renault, finished Jessica Andrade, fought Julia Avila really early on in 2012, finished Talita Bernardo, finished Sarah McMahon. That's a great win, feather in your cap. Lost to Katzengano, lost to Yana Kunitskaya. Should have won that fight. 
fought Raquel Pennington in a competitive fight back last year, June of last year, and then got her ears boxed, boxed in by Macy Chasson. But when I look at the names that she was booked in to fight, even some of the bookings that fell out, Macy Chasson, Catlin Vieira, Raquel Pennington, Catlin Vieira, Irene Aldana, Yana Kunitskaya, Tanya Evinger at one point, still big names and still big names that they've been booking her against. Marion Renault right now booked in the lower half of this division's top 15. So again, it's a good fight to realize where both women are at. Marion Renault, though, these last fights, three months ago, a year ago, around then, uh, two years, three months, two years, 11 months, three years, four months. She's fought five fights in the time that Misha Tate hasn't fought one. So for Misha Tate, this is my problem. I look at Misha Tate like a female Ken Shamrock. And I look at uh, Ronda Rousey as a female Hoist Gracie. Whereas in the early days of the women's divisions, they were dominated by specialists. Like Ronda Rousey, what was her specialty? It was the judo. And I understand she expanded her boxing, if you will. But she really was a specialist. And Misha Tate really was the same thing. She could box a little bit, but her wrestling is her specialty. The question is, does that kind of specialty... does? Do those types of specialists still win in today's MMA? I honestly think Misha Tate's going to beat Marion Renault this weekend. But the real question mark is where does she go after this? Because the thing about Marion Renault is, yes, she's a good BJJ black belt. She's not good off of her back, and it's kind of weird. She can just get held down and be controlled in bottom position. And against someone like Misha Tate, that's really all Misha Tate does. I really do think Misha Tate can go out there and simply get three takedowns in this fight. But my issue is that we're going to lead this fight with all this Misha Tate hype. People are going to be like, wow, she looks so good. But she looks so good against a 44-year-old on a four-fight losing streak. It's just, I don't want people to get caught up in the Misha Tate hype just in case she does beat Marion Renault. I don't think she's going to be a top fighter in this division whatsoever. And I really do think Misha Tate would have a hard time against, like, the Aspen Lads of the world in this division. You know, the fighters who are, A, not in their 40s, but B, they just are more of what a modern mixed martial artist is. They're not just a wrestler. They're not just a boxer. They're a well-rounded fighter. So I guess my prediction is that... Misha Tate should win this fight against Marion Renault, but she doesn't accept damage all that well. And Marion Renault, oddly enough, is one of the more heavy-handed 44-year-olds out there. So I, I I, see there being a path for Marion Renault. I just find it really hard taking it myself. Tate opened a plus 115 underdog. She's a minus 138 favorite right now. Renault opened a minus 135 favorite. She's a plus 113 underdog right now. Over on Topology, total votes, 1,121. 86% Tate, 80% by decision. 14% that I'm marrying Renault to win, 79% by decision. Honestly, everybody out there, I'm on the fence about this one. I'm going to see these two weigh in. I'm going to tell you question mark kicks. And I'm going to see that Misha Tate physically looks way better than Marion Renault. And it might sway me even more. I'm scared away from throwing this on my parlay or even my question mark kicks parlay. I'm ever so slightly going with Tate because Marion Renault's defensive wrestling isn't great. Awful, some might say. Marion Renault can take a beating though. And she can give one too. Go back and watch that Yana Kunitskaya fight if you want to see one. Because I th really thought Renault won that fight. And at the end I went, well, come on. It was a draw. So I will go with the all the unknowns of Misha Tate in this fight, which I normally don't do. But I will go with that. Because if she's in, uh, you know, even a small percentage of what she was at the top, she could have a competitive fight here. But if they put her against, like, I think a good fight, and it's weird would be Juliana Pena, who's getting a title shot. Like, I think that's the fight that I would sooner see than a lot of fights in this top 15 women's bantamweight. But other than that, it's really tough to predict the future. If you're coming back to be champion, what have you added to your game that makes me think you're going to beat Nunes? Because just wrestling doesn't do it. We've seen what jiu-jitsu does. Amanda Nunes is normally better than the jiu-jitsu fighters in there. And you can't strike with her whatsoever. So again, I do like Tate in this fight. But for me, I have no idea where either one of these women go after this one. Both of us ever so slightly... And so, so scared. Going with Cupcake Misha Tate. You let us know if we're lunatics down below in the comments section, as you normally do. And hey, you're not going to want to miss our main event video from Makachev versus Moise. So stick around for that. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks. And as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it. Big time main event coming up this weekend. It's not the featherweight pairing that we were due. Max Holloway is supposed to take on Yair Rodriguez. But we do have a neat fight coming up at lightweight. Russia's Islam Makachev taking on Brazil's Thiago Moises. And Matt, we talked about it behind the scenes. We said, hey, you can find us at Craig Allen FNP on Twitter and Instagram. At Matt Allen FNP on the respective socials. But Thiago Moises, I don't know who flipped the switch in this guy's face in his last two fights. But it's third to last fight. He fought Michael Johnson. He gets beat in terms of the boxing by Johnson in the first round. Johnson's going to win the fight. And then in the second round, it's like Michael Johnson got lazy and Tiago Moises took his leg home. Oh. 
But in Tiago's last two fights, it's like he watched that movie Drive Angry, and he just decided, I'm going to fight angry and pissed off. And it's like a whole new Tiago Moises. He fights Bobby Green. He bites down on the mouthpiece. Whole new guy. Then he brings it into his last fight against Alexander Hernandez and totally outstrikes him. And it's like, who the hell is this guy? It feels like Tiago Moises, and listen, this is going to be a big over-exaggeration, but just bear with me. He's on one of those Charles Oliveira type streaks before Oliveira got his chance to fight the top guys in the division. Now, the difference is that Oliveira was finishing guys on the mat and on the feet, and it was knockout submission pretty much every time out there. But Moises has some of the game that Oliveira does. The jiu-jitsu of Moises is not something that you want to mess around with whatsoever, and we really did see that in the Michael Johnson fight. How many Michael Johnson fights has he look great until he hasn't. A lot of them. And that was really what happened in the Moises fight because it was weird. Moises, just didn't, he didn't seem comfortable on the feet with Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson was having his way with him. But the second that the tie did switch in that fight and Moises was able to get that 50-50 position on the leg, you could just tell that there was such a big skill gap in the grappling between those two guys. And like, Michael Johnson's not a terrible grappler. I understand that's not at the forefront of his game, but it's not like Michael Johnson's out here getting submitted by everybody. And the fact that Moises beat him by heel hook too, like that's such an impressive way to beat a guy. And it will be really interesting against a guy like Islam Makashev because for Makashev, we had a little bit of pushback, oddly enough, in his last performance against Drew Dober. I know we were both pretty confident that he was going to beat Dober, but it did feel like there were a lot of people out there saying, oh, if Dober can only defend a couple takedown tests, if he can just keep this on the feet past the first, you know, few minutes, then he might be able to land a big shot. The issue is that Makashev hasn't really shown us throughout his career that A, he is overly hittable, and B, he's just so dominant with the wrestling. It's that, okay, what's your counter to my, like, one-two? It's to wrestle you. What's your counter to my jiu-jitsu? It's to wrestle you. And the top position of Makashev is just so dominant that he might be one of those few fighters out there who can go out there and actually get an offensive takedown on Moises and not pay with it by getting submitted immediately. So, Islam Makachev famously has only lost one fight, and it was against Adriano Martins in his second UFC fight. He gets knocked out in the first round. He gets caught with a crazy shot, and Martins back in his day was a really good it fighter. Was. So since then he goes out, he beats Chris Wade, Nick Lentz, Gleason Tebow, Cajun Johnson, Armin Zaruki, and Davi Hamosh, Drew Dober, and now he gets Tiago Moises. And he finally gets his main event, and the most important part, this is a five-round fight. He was supposed to have a five-round fight against Rafael Dos Anjos when they had to move it around, shake it out. Dos Anjos tested positive for COVID, Makachev was out of the fight. It was craziness all around. But finally, we get a five-round Makachev fight. So now we get to see what you're made of. But Matt, we have to throw it on over to the Fight Night Picks fans. We thank you There's because, listen, it's been absolutely insane. Last weekend was insane. I threw it out there for a poll in the community tab. Another big week ahead with UFC Vegas 31 and another lightweight main event. Is somebody going to break a leg? Probably not. But who's getting the win? 89% of 1,900 total votes went Makachev. 11% with Moses. And we'll give you, again, some credit. Vex... Isidic said, you guys did great last week. Well, thank you. Thank we you. appreciate that. Akash Deep, you're always there every week. Time for Islam to do his thing. He's a future champ for sure. Uh, Tamo said, voting for Moises so I can get a better bet line. Go on anyway, Crow. Moses will have to part some rivers in order to win here. Me thanks. Pretty good. And the last one that we'll go with, Matt, we will go and pick, um, who else? Moro D says, Moises has a real chance of beating Islam. And Wyatt Kenny, for fun, you're here every week. Everybody's so confident in Islam. While well, I do think he will get the win, Tiago Moises being overlooked slightly here. I think that we've thrown Tiago Moises a bone because this is a guy that I always thought of as, man, his jiu-jitsu is insane. He's really young in the division. And even though he lost to Robert Watley with LFA, Benil Dariush and Demiris Magulov, the guy still has a high ceiling. It was just after those losses, it kind of clouded my judgment as to how good he could be. His last three fights, he's looked really good. His last two, he's looked great. His last fight, he looked amazing. He did, but unfortunately, he's fighting a guy who doesn't entertain any of the ranges or the strengths that Tiago Moises himself has. For Moises, he is good with jiu-jitsu off his back, but I'm having a very hard time thinking of ways that he's going to be able to submit Islam Makashev, a guy who's been training with the likes of, like, Habib his whole entire life, and Habib is quite good at submissions in his own right. So, for me, I think Moises can have success, oddly enough, on the feet more than on the yeah. mat. I do think he can actually box up Makashev a little bit, but again, it's always going to come down to, can you defend the takedown attempts of Islam Makashev? And... Here's the one good thing I'll say. We're going to learn a lot about Islam in a five-round atmosphere because let's say Moises can extend this past the second round, into the third round, even the fourth and the fifth. We might see Makachev fall off a cliff. Like, he does fight with a very, very high work rate and he's a guy who you could very see, very well see, okay, he can fight like this for two rounds and then the cardio falls off and you can beat him in the last three. I, 
I just feel like we look at Makachev and we just assume that, okay, his ceiling is Habib's ceiling, but I honestly don't think that's the case. I think he'll go out there and beat Tiago Moises in what should be a much more fun fight than the odds would suggest, but personally, I don't see his ceiling being like title or bust. It might seem crazy to you to think that Moises would have success striking. Islam Makachev right now holds the UFC all-time record for every division, everything put together and everybody that's ever fought in it. It strikes absorbed per minute at 0.77. And I mean, you look at the stats, it's an absolutely incredible line. You should definitely check it out. UFC stats, wherever you can find them. But if you do look at it, yeah, the differential is great. Two strikes landed per minute to 0.77 absorbed. That's a 70% defensive clip. Moises has a 60% defensive clip. That's pretty good in his own right. Take down defense for Makachev, 93%. Nobody's taking him down. No. He's taking you down. If we have a look at the votes, again, they weren't even close. Topology is the same. So let's have a look at the odds because you did talk about them just quickly. He opened a minus 500, did Makachev. He's a minus 671 right now on best fight odds. For Tiago Moises, open plus 375. He's plus 461 right now. He has so much stacked against him in terms of... Like, like I, I understand it. Everybody out there right now, or the large majority... A lot of Makachev support, a lot of fans for this guy. I think his style is very exciting, where it's weird, right? He's not one of those guys that I would expect to, you plop him down in Vegas, throw him in the main event of a big pay-per-view. Fans are probably going to boo parts of it because he's going to work for the takedown. He's going to have you on the mat. He's going to transition a lot, get into a favorable, favorable position, and then they're cheering because he cinched up either submission really quickly or he knocked a guy out on the ground. Like, he does insane things. But he's such a tricky fighter. I think for all of those reasons, even some of the intangibles, I like Makachev in this fight. But I'm of that camp that, do I like him at those odds? Not necessarily for me, but I'm not the type to stretch it over a minus 500. I've been burned in the past. Okay, I feel like we say that a lot, but this is one of the few times where I don't look at this like a big parlay buster. Like, Tiago Moises, I think, is a borderline top 15 talent on his best day. He's in it now. He is, but th this is what I mean. Like, he's like, what, 14th right now, 15th? I think he's one of those fighters where if he gets a great win, then they'll just throw him in the rankings as an excuse to have him in the rankings. I think Islam is going to be able to wrestle a lot of guys in the top 10 and the top 15. It just comes down to where is his ceiling? Like, can you wrestle everybody till he meets Justin Gaethje? And then it's like, okay, once I get a few takedown attempts denied, then I get beat up on the feet. Or will his wrestling style really just carry him all the way to the title? It very well could happen because we've seen a guy with a very similar style to his own do the exact same thing. So for me, I like Makashev in this fight. It's really unfortunate that A, this is first uh, main event because there's no hype around this main event. Let's call it what it is. And it's unfortunate because for Makashev, he is one of those guys who he just needs the opportunity. He just needs the opportunity. You finally give him the opportunity, but the B-side in this fight is barely a B-side. And listen, it's nothing against Tiago Moises, it's just he doesn't really have a massive fan following behind him, and he hasn't had the chance to really prove himself against the upper level either. So it's just unfortunate that this is the main event both guys are in. I think these are both really fun fighters, but I do like Makachev quite a bit. Can't wait to see the fight. Both of us going with Russia's Islam Makachev in this fight. You're not going to want to miss the rest of the content from Fight Night Picks this week. We got a couple of great interviews stacked, locked, and loaded in the queue. Ooh. They're going to be dropping. They're in the lower weight classes, so I'm looking forward to those. We've also got question mark kicks on the weekend. It's two hours before the prelims, so if you're subscribed already, hit the notification bell. If you're not subscribed, subscribe and then hit the notification bell. Likes are always appreciated. Those are always free. You can help out the guys by checking out the store at fightnightpicks.com. we get great stuff over there. Articles, write-ups of the interviews as well. It's Joshua Hart's full card betting guide who hit on a what? Plus 900 It was a nice one. Last weekend, as well as the QMK parlay that hits. You're not going to want to miss all of that content. And you can find us over at 15-Minute Card Breaks. Great stuff over there, too, if you're just an overall sports fan. As always, enjoy the fights this week. And as we always say, Matt, with Fight Night Picks, let's, let's get, get into it. it.